So we've been thinking about in, in the Revelations made the Sister Mary of St. Peter. She is, for those who, who don't know, um, she, she is the Carmelite nun who received many revelations about the Holy Face devotion in the 1840s. And um, of course, the Holy Face devotion really began right from the time when our Lord took on nature. Um, but it was kind of hidden, if you like, and not very well known. But in the 1840s, that's when Sister Mary of St. Peter received many revelations about the Holy Face devotion and on the connection between the Holy Face and the work of reparation, especially reparation for blasphemy. Now, one of these revelations, our Lord said to her that um, the, the church, his spouse, is his mystical body, and religion is the face of that mystical body. And that blasphemers, or all those who attack religion, they, it is as though they were spitting upon his face. Um, he is one with his church, so when we attack the church, we attack him, himself. Um, he, the mystical body, the church, that includes every baptized soul. Every, everybody who has been baptized belongs to the church, even if they are in the state of mortal sin. They still have that indelible mark on their soul, which makes them a member of that mystical body and those who are the, the sins committed by the members of that body they make it disfigured in appearance and so he said religion is the face of the mystical body so when I was uh, doing a little bit of study to prepare for the talk I looked up well what does the what is the definition of religion and um, Father jean he wrote a very good life of Sister Mary of St. Peter. He's also written the life of the Holy Man of Tours. And he had a good commentary on this passage. He said that um, religion, we can understand it as the doctrine. The doctrine which teaches us what to believe and to practice and how to worship God. It is the doctrine of the Church that makes her visible. and. It is that it is the the face the face of a person is what makes us recognize that person. So in the same way, it is the doctrine of the church by which we recognize her. And um, now, Saint Thomas Aquinas says that religion is a virtue by which men show fitting worship and reverence to God. So there are sins against religion sins against the doctrine of the church, sins against the worship and reverence that we owe to God. And in the Catechism, it, get, it gives five examples of sins against religion. So there is idolatry, superstition, false worship, sacrilege, and blasphemy. Now, all of these five we are seeing today when we look at the official Catholic Church, we do not see anything very attractive about it. On the contrary, it looks very disfigured and hard to recognize and harder still to love it. We have to understand that what we are seeing is in, in a similar way it is, it is like what the people in Judea saw on Good Friday when our Lord was making his way to Calvary. They had seen him as the great miracle worker. Like in, in the Gospel today, we had the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. They saw him as this great miracle worker. He was going to save Israel. And then on Good Friday, there was a complete change. They saw him despised by the Pharisees, condemned to death. They saw his face completely disfigured. He had been terribly scourged, crowned with thorns, treated as a criminal. And many of them changed their minds about him when they saw him in that state. 
there were only a very few who had the faith, who still recognized him as the great Messiah, who still believed him to be God. Only a very few. And it was only those few who looked beyond appearances, beyond what they could see, that recognized him for what he was. And Veronica was one of those. One of those few who had the faith, who, who recognized him, in spite of the disfigured appearance. Well, we are all called to be Veronicas. We are all called to recognize the Catholic Church beneath the disfigured appearance. And that doesn't mean tolerating error. It doesn't mean loving the errors of the Church. It doesn't mean loving what makes her uh, disfigured in appearance but it means loving her for what she really is. Now the Catholic Church is much more than a group of men. It is much more than a hierarchical structure. The Catholic Church is a mystical body, the mystical body of Christ. Um, and a mystical body, of course there is its visible element, but there is also a divine element. The divine element is received from Christ, and that is the doctrine, the true doctrine of the Church, um, which is pure, holy, and unspotted, and nothing, nothing can take away from that beauty. But there is also the human element, because it is not only our Lord, it is not only himself who is the mystical body, it is every one of us. And we have the possibility, because of our free will, to commit sins, and we do. And that is, that, in a certain way, it disfigures the church. It disfigures the appearance of the church and makes it... So, I mentioned the five sins against religion, and I was just thinking how how that applies today to the situation we see in the Catholic Church. Um, well, all around us we see people who have fallen into idolatry. Now it's not, in most cases, the same kind of idolatry that was in the Old Testament, where people had images of, say, uh, different kinds of animals or people, and they would they would fall down and worship these, oh, these, these, these statues, if you like. They would worship them as being God. Um, today we have different kinds of false gods. We have the false gods of, say, money, power, uh, work, yes, material things, self is the main one. But, like, you see, you see there are many Farmers, for example, who put all their all their time, all their life, all their energy into building up a wonderful herd of cattle, um, into getting more and more land, and into getting a fine big house. They spend their whole life working for that, and everything else takes a second place, including God. That is a form of idolatry. And um, there are others who make sports the God they live for. Everything else takes a back seat. And um, you will see people missing mass on Sunday to attend a sports match. That shows that for them, sports is more important than God. So that too is a form of idolatry. And um, there, there are many, many more examples, the list could go on and on, but that is just a few examples of idolatry as we see it today. There is superstition, that's another sin against religion. And we, we have seen it ourselves in, in the town sometimes, people will come over and ask us, have you got a meadow, sister? Will, will you give me a meadow? And then, then they'll start talking and they'll say, well, Will you give me one for my partner? So they're obviously living in sin. And they, they don't seem to realize the contradiction, but it is a contradiction. If, if you think that by wearing many holy medals around your neck, 
that's going to be enough to save you when you're not keeping the commandments? Well, you're quite mistaken. That is superstition. Putting too much faith in material things, in any kind of object, without um, living what that object signifies. So there's not, not much point in uh, wearing many medals around your neck and at the same time going on living a sinful life with no desire to amend. Um, superstition and um, external piety, we see a lot of that um, because like even in the lockdown we see how many people fell away from the faith, how many stopped attending mass and many of them haven't come back since the church has reopened and that's because their religion was only an outward, an outward show. There was not the true spirit there to to sustain it. So superstition, um, we, ca we cannot be saved just by an outward show of religion. Our religion has to go much deeper. Uh, then there is false worship. And of course we see many examples in the new church with the ecumenical meetings and the meetings in the past of Assisi, the Assisi meetings, um, interreligious dialogues and all these things. Um, that is promoting false worship um, when they all worship together and say well you worship your God I'll worship my God and we'll all worship together that is a kind of false worship and um, there is with the new mass especially and um, that too is a kind of false worship because the new mass is an expression of a new doctrine and it is not only as many people may be deceived in thinking and may be led to believe it is not only a difference between the language and it is not only a difference between a few prayers or the priest facing the people instead of facing the altar and there is a whole new theology behind the new mass if you study it and read through the prayers and compare the prayers of the two, the, the, the new Mass and the old Mass, the traditional Mass, you will start to see the, the, the complete difference. And then if you take the new Mass and compare it with the Protestant service, you will see many, many similarities. And that wasn't just an accident. That was deliberate. And the new Mass conveys the impression that it is a meal and that it is a fraternal gathering um, where we're all going to be in communion with one another and have a good time together and uh, there are so many abuses in, in the new mass, so much lack of reverence and um, so often you will see the priest just making things up as he goes along and um, with no no reference, no no attention to the rubrics, and and that was all deliberate. There was a plan um, to destroy the church. Many of you know about this already. But the new mass is not just uh, the Latin mass translated into English. It is a completely new, as it says a new mass of a new religion so it, it, it if it expresses the way we the way we pray is the way we believe the law of prayer so if we pray in a way that shows we think the mass is only a meal well sooner or later that's the way we start to believe whereas the mass is really a sacrifice in which Christ, Jesus Christ, is truly present. And the way we worship has to reflect that. Otherwise, we will soon start to change our belief, to follow the way we worship. The way we believe and the way we worship has to go together. So there is also sacrilege. 
which is the profanation of holy things or holy places. And there, there in, in the new church, the practice of receiving communion on the hand, that has led to many, many sacrileges. And the, the sacred host treated with the reverence. And there is no, no care taken to gather up the little particles. And if the host is truly consecrated, and it's not always certain it is, especially if the priest does not have the intention to consecrate. Um, but if, if the host is truly consecrated, then our Lord Jesus Christ is present in every tiny particle. And when people carelessly receive it in the hand, lay people, and they go off carrying the sacred host, and these particles fall on the floor, people trample on it, and um, that is Jesus they are trampling on, not just a piece of bread, it is really Jesus they are trampling on. Uh, that is sacrilege. There is also the sacrilege when people receive communion in the state of mortal sin, and that is encouraged more and more, even by those who appear to be the official leaders of the church. And these sacrileges are and that th they are very painful to our Lord. They wound his heart very deeply. And, and then the last of these five that we mentioned, the five sins against religion, is blasphemy, which is making a mockery of holy things. And profane jokes or taking the holy name in vain, we know that, we hear it all the time. There are other forms of blasphemy as well. If we call ourselves Catholics or Christians and we do not live a Christ-like life, that too is a blasphemy. And also, when we see people who claim to speak in the name of Christ, so the leaders of the church, when they say they are, when they claim they are, or, or appear to be speaking in the name of Christ, and they use that, that power or that position that they have to promote error, that too is a blasphemy. So these are just some of the many sins against religion which we see in the church, and they demand reparation. These sins disfigure the face of the church. They make it difficult to recognize her, hard to love her. But we have to look deeper than that. We have to see that it is not the Catholic Church herself who is to blame for this. It is not the doctrine of the Church which has failed. It is the people of the Church, the men of the Church, who have disfigured her by their sins, by departing from that doctrine, by not living up to that doctrine. And so, we must not add to the disfigurement by joining in these sins, by participating in them, um, or by compromising, by not, uh, by acting as though it were no concern of ours and just going along with the crowd. The crowd is probably not evil. I would not say the crowd is evil. Just like in the time of our Lord, most of the people were not really evil. If, if they were left to themselves, they wouldn't have demanded his death. But there were a few evil people in the crowd. The scribes, the Pharisees, they were filled with hatred against our Lord. And it was they who demanded his death, and they stirred up the people to also demand his death, to, to demand that he be crucified. And the crowd was weak, the crowd was easily influenced, and they did as these evil men, these evil leaders, told them to do. And these evil leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, they were the official religious leaders of the day. But the people had seen our Lord, they had heard his preaching, they had heard the truth. And they had enough, enough grace, enough 
reason, enough common sense to know what was the right thing to do. But many of them did not do it out of fear, out of cowardice. Now later they, there were many of them who converted and repented. But the point is, we cannot allow ourselves to be influenced by the crowd. We have to have courage, like Veronica did, to step out of the crowd in order to console our Lord. And it takes courage to go against the flow, to do what those around us are not doing. It takes courage to stand up for truth. But that is what our Lord is asking. He is asking us, he said to Sister Mary of St. Peter, I seek Veronicus. And he said that whoever engages in the work of reparation, by that very fact, they perform the same service Veronica did. So when we make reparation, when we say these prayers of reparation, when we do what we can to uh, to stop the blasphemies around us or to, to pray in reparation when we hear blasphemy, we are consoling our Lord just as Veronica did. And uh, Veronica, when she stepped out of the crowd to wipe our Lord's face, it probably didn't seem like a very big thing she was doing. Uh, it seemed a kind of insignificant thing um, just to wipe the face of our Lord. Well, he went on and he was crucified anyway. But it consoled our Lord greatly and it had a tremendous impact on the faithful after her because we still have to this very day the relic of the veil of Veronica in the Vatican and this relic has worked many miracles um, in one of the previous talks we mentioned about Leo de Pont he had a copy of the veil of Veronica uh, which he hung in his home he had an oil lamp burning before it and through the oil from that lamp numerous miracles were worked. Now if it hadn't been for Veronica, we would not have that relic of her veil. If it hadn't been for her courageous action, none of those miracles which took place through Leo de Pont would have happened. So when we make reparation, we generally do not see the result. Um, but our reparation has a far-reaching effect. And nothing we do um, is insignificant. Whether it's good or evil, it has an effect on the entire mystical body because we are members of one body. We are members of the church. We are members of Jesus Christ. And so whatever we do, whether it is good or evil, it has an immediate effect on all the other members of that body. So if one saint, if there was one saint here in this room, that would uh, be an advantage to the rest of us. Um, if, there was, if there was one of us, just one, who was a great saint, um, that would be a, a source of grace for all the rest of us. So when we when we engage in the work of reparation, when we act like Veronica did, <coughs> we counteract these sins, these blasphemies, these sins against religion. We console the holy face, we console the face of the church, and we show what it really means to be a true Christian, a true image. That's what Veronica means. Any questions? Just one other thing I was going to bring up with with the, the disfigurement of the face of the church. Um, there's a lot of division, even among traditional Catholics. Um, people are forming themselves into, into different groups and attacking one another. And that is not the way to, to bring about the, the healing of the face of the church. Um, yes, we do have to separate ourselves to a certain extent from 
from those who are uh, in error, so like not participating in 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 the in modernism or in in the in the masses where our Lord is being profaned, and um, but we also must not go to the other extreme of thinking well we are the only ones being saved we are the church everybody else is outside the church and criticizing because that's not the way to bring healing we have to realize that they have the those who are committing these sins who are disfiguring the face of the church they have been if you like affected by the cancer of modernism so they are sick they are they are sick members and they need us to pray for them, to compassionate them and to, to set them a good example. Prayer, example and charity, that is the way to, uh, to bring healing, to, to win others over to the truth. We don't want to, to judge them, to condemn them, to criticize them because that only hardens them against the truth, but we want to to pray for them and to try our best to convert them because that is what will bring healing to the church that is what will console our Lord and console his holy face